Good morning. Uh, great to see everybody here. Um, as you know, this is the John H. Kersley Memorial Lecture on Translational Cancer Research. Uh, welcome everybody here. I'm Doug Yee. I'm the director. Uh, for those of you that didn't get a chance to know John, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, how important he was to the founding of this cancer center and to the field in general. Dr. Kersey is a product of Minnesota. Uh, he went to high school at Washburn High School, except for a brief period of time in his undergraduate career when he left for Dartmouth. I guess he figured needed more snow than here or something. Uh, came back and went to medical school here uh, and had his entire career here. Uh, Dr. Kersey was a pioneer uh, in bone marrow transplant. Uh, he performed the first um, uh, allogeneic transplant in pediatric lymphoma. Uh, and as last I checked, the, the patient who he transplanted the first is still doing well uh, and is uh, ha had been back at several cancer center events over the course of the years. As you also probably know, Dr. Kirsty was the founding director of the Masonic Cancer Center. This is a picture of the cover of Cancer Research uh, when we were first designated as the NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center. I know that most of you don't live in the NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center world these days, but it is a, to his uh, testament to his leadership that when we were first awarded, we were awarded the comprehensive status and a full five-year designation, which I don't think happens much anymore. Uh, and certainly was a, a was a testament to all the work that we do here, as well as um, the uh, the strength of his leadership. Uh, I do want to comment. This picture is, is him standing outside uh, bone marrow transplant unit very early on in his career. Um, he was a prototype of the physician scientist. I believe he still had an actively funded R01 all the way through his entire career. He brought that knowledge to the patient's bedside, and he was really a model for many of us. And I feel lucky to have been mentored by him, as well as many of the people in the room. So with that introduction, I'm going to let Dr. Miller introduce this year's uh, Chrissy's lecture. Thank you, Doug. Welcome, everybody. I think this has been the uh, most packed this conference room has been in four years, if I remember correctly. So it's really a great honor to invite a good friend and colleague, Mike Kelly Jury. Um, Mike uh, got his bachelor degree in 1979 from SUNY Buffalo. And in 1982 and 83, he got an MS and an MD degree at Stanford University. He then, uh, in his excellence for training, went on to do his residency at Harvard and fellowship at Dana-Farber. And in 2000, he somehow got wooed to Southern Ohio, which having been born in Cleveland, we never went south to Southern Ohio. But Mike became the division director of hematology oncology in 2000. I mean, in 2007 to 2018, he was the CEO of the James Hospital at the Ohio State University. And then I think Mike got tired of the cold and he wanted to ride his bike to work. I think early on, you told me your biggest risk was getting sunburn on your ride to work every morning. So he was recruited and became the president at the City of Hope. Um, Mike has really countless awards, and I can't go through all of them, otherwise we'll go to 1130, but he is still the recipient of an R35 Outstanding Investigator Award entitled Human and Cells Advancing Biology and Clinical Application. He has had many PO1s in the past. He still is part of a PO1 called Circulating Barriers to Effective Oncolytic Viral Therapy of Malignant Gliomas. In 2017, he was the president of AACR. In 2018, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Mike has had really hundreds of trainees, including our own Nick Zorko, who is here today. Um, I always like to go back and look at first author publications. In 1985, Mike, your first listed first author publication was entitled Prolonged Diving and Recovery in Freshwater Turtles. And you really come a long way from that. And I think one of the 
Well, one of the papers that we know and really admire Mike in our field and our NK program is really in 1990, he had a JEM paper along with his mentor, Jerry Ritz, called Functional Consequences of Interleukin-2 Receptor Expression on Resting Human Lymphocytes, Identification of a Novel Natural Killer Cell Subset with High Affinity Receptors. So um, Mike has really been a leader in the NK cell field. Um, he's been part of that biology for many, many years. Um, he's had over 400 papers, hundreds of keynote lectureships, dozens of patents and company partnerships. Mike is here to celebrate and honor John Kersey. I really could not think of a person to honor John who really, I think, had similar attitudes, and that's Mike Caligiuri. Mike is a kind, strong leader, as was John, with a big heart, who has spent his entire academic career training, uh, advocating for academics, leading cancer centers, and building healthcare. So, Mike, welcome to Minnesota. In your honor, we turned off the snow, but it's coming as soon as you leave, maybe. It, 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 but it does have to get a little bit cooler. So thank you for coming, and we enjoy it. Mike, as a uh, small token of our appreciation, we wanted to give you this to commemorate your, oh. your talk. Thank you. It's a hockey puck. It's very Minnesota. Wow. This is and, great, John. And I should have mentioned to the group, so our format's a little bit different today. We'll have an extra time for questions, so don't leave at the top of the hour, and we'll have a, re a reception afterwards, so stick around. Thank you. Mind. Thank you. Of course, if you have to leave, we're going to let you leave. Don't worry. Don't so, Just for a second. Yeah. Can we change your slides? Please. So it's great to be here, and Jeff, thank you for such a gracious introduction. Um, I... Um, I'm really honored to be here, uh, and so nice to see all of you. Many of you I know through the years. I think the first time I was here, uh, Tucker invited me to come up, and I had the pleasure to sit and chat with with Dr. Kersey. And uh, Jeff, of all the wonderful things you said about me, I would say that the uh, the nicest thing you said was comparing me to John, uh, because. One thing you could say about Dr. Kersey amidst all his incredible academic accolades, he's really a nice person. Uh, for those of you who knew him, and I'm sorry to all of these that never got to know him. There's a lot of young faces here, but just a wonderful human being. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very honored. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, talking about NK cells in front of Jeff Miller is really embarrassing. <laughs> so... I'm not going to talk about NK cells, just, just how, I, how NK cells led uh, us down a different path, um, a really exciting path. Um, but because Jeff's here, I had to work really hard to put this talk together. That's the first time I'm ever giving it. So um, I'm going to stay away from, you know, because his, his accomplishments in the field are unsurpassed. But, um, but I'm going to use it as a, as a starting point to talk about uh, a few things. Um, so this is uh, peripheral blood of someone getting very low doses of IL-2, and you see the large granular lymphocytes and the smaller lymphocyte, which we would call a, a T and a B cell or a B cell. And I want you to remember that picture as we get towards the end of the talk. And what we're going to really talk about today is a, is a family of lymphocytes called innate lymphoid cells. And you know, I'm not speaking to Jeff or Bruce or Tucker. I'm really speaking to the students who. Um, and students, we're all students, but uh, that really don't know much about this family of lymphocytes, which is really just about 10 years old, so it's, it's relatively new. Tell a little story about how our lab and some other labs jumped into this area by accident, as most science occurs. And then use, as I say, from a starting block of NK cells, talk a little bit about NK pathology, because I'm going to talk about NK development. And then really switch into how those two areas led us to innate lymphoid cells. And I'm going to talk about three or four different types of innate lymphoid cells. I'm going to talk about two, ILC1 and ILC2, and hopefully tell you some things that you may not know about them that we didn't know just a short while ago. So as I say, I'm going to launch from NK development, and you're going to see why. 
back in the day, um, this is what was known about NK cell development experiments that Jeff did and others where you could take CD34 cells and put them in high doses of IL-2, and they made these CD56 bright, large granular lymphocytes. But some work genetic disruption studies in the mouse told us that probably IL-2 wasn't the cytokine in vivo, first of all, only being released by activated T cells, so in tiny amounts, and you have billions and billions of NK cells. And so when the disruption of the IL-2 receptor in mice occurred, and the alpha chain, because there's three chains for the IL-2 receptor, those mice still had NK cells. So right there we knew uh, that they were uh, using something else. But then when we disrupted the beta chain of the IL-2 receptor and the gamma chain of the IL-2 receptor, the two other chains, no NK cells. And so that told us that something that didn't require the alpha chain, didn't require IL-2, but did require the beta gamma chain was important for NK cell development. So here's the, the alpha heterotrimeric receptor. And that little alpha chain doesn't do much, except it confers very high affinity for IL-2. It scarfs up IL-2, not found on the majority of NK cells. Here's what's found on the majority of NK cells. And you need lots of IL-2 to tickle these two signal transducing chains. And that's why high doses of IL-2 will get you NK cells, but not really physiologic. But in fact, what Mother Nature had done has made a second alpha chain, which by itself has very high affinity for a different molecule called interleukin-15, which many of you know about. And it binds to the beta gamma in a transposition from antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells. And that's really what's responsible for activating NK cells and, as I'll show you here, for generating NK cells because mice that lack IL-15 or lack that alpha chain, which by itself binds the IL-15, have little or no NK cells. And here you see the same experiment, but instead of IL-2, we're using IL-15. And this is a flow diagram showing the CD56 and the bright, and those are the earliest NK cells. And by the way, you'll see some pictures of people that did a lot of the work along the way from the lab over the decades. So the picture looked something like this roughly for many years. Uh, you know, this earlier ligands that bind tyrosine kinases, KIT ligand or FLT3 ligand, likely upregulate those chains of uh, beta gamma on this cell here. And so we went looking for this cell. Um, and we said, well, what we'll do is we'll use antibodies to the beta chain and the gamma chain, C34, and we'll find that cell. And that's the NK precursor. Couldn't find it but the cells were responsive to IL-15, all the CD34 cells. So we knew that they must have the receptors, but they're just below detection and fax scanning at that time. So what we did is we took CD34 cells and we broke them into three groups, as you can see here by these two markers. And what we then did is we put IL-15 or high doses of IL-2 in front of them. And only this third group that has the CD34 lower expression made the CD56 bright NK cells. And so that told us that the beta gamma expressing cells must be in this particular group. And we took that group and we did lots of flow. And I'm just showing two from over a hundred different molecules that we looked at. And what we found is that that third group that did become NK with the IL-15 um, had high surface density expression of L-selectin and beta-7 integrin. And that, and this is all in human, by the way, and those are two molecules that traffic cells to lymph nodes. And at that time, if you had done a PubMed search for lymph node or lymph, or lymphoid tissue and NK cells, not a single publication. But Mother Nature was telling us that's where these cells are going. So in fact, um, we took first peripheral blood and we ran it through a CD34 column and lo and behold, you got these three CD34 populations. We did the same thing with lymph nodes, and look what happened. We only got the third population. And then, in fact, we were able to show that the parafollicular T-cell-rich region of lymph nodes have these CD34 cells there, right, right in the lymph node. And further, we could sort these cells out and put them in IL-15 alone, and sure enough, they generated the CD56 bright NK cells. So um, at that time, someone else in the lab, Todd Feniger, um, 
went looking in the lymph nodes and showed that, you know what, I can find the CD56 bright cells right in the same region as the CD34 cells. So then we had the idea, well, maybe CD34 cells, CD56 bright cells, maybe lymph nodes are where NK cells develop. And at that time, nobody knew in humans where they develop. T cells in the thymus, B cells in the bone marrow, but NK cells was unknown. And so what another person in lab, Ronnie, did, Ronnie Freud, is he did lots of flow cytometry and found that if you looked at CD34 alone and then acquiring CKIT and then losing CD34, staying CKIT, and then losing CKIT but acquiring CD94, and you ask, do these cells express CD56, you see what happens is you get this gradual progression. And these became the first four stages of NK cell development in secondary lymphoid tissue. And we showed this in tonsil and as well as lymph nodes from all over the body that where, of course, the DCs are and where the IL-15 is. And this, this actually began to make a lot of sense. And so a fruit picture at the time was, well, T cells go to thymus and um, B cells go stay in the bone marrow. But NK cells, after they move a little bit from that stem cell, traffic off to the lymph node and in the presence of IL-15 and other cytokines as well goes through this progression. So fast forward 10 years, Ronnie's now done with his MD-PhD, went off and trained at Stanford in pathology, came back to the lab and really wanted to start working on this again. And what he really worked out was a pathway of NK cell development, in this case, starting at stage three, uh, where you're CKIT or CD117 positive, and then you acquire CD94, and then you acquire P80, and then you acquire CD16. And so now it's not four, but it's five, and actually now it's six with these 4A and 4B, et cetera. And so why is this important? So, well, one reason it's important is pathobiology. So, this stage 4A cell, for example, is only found in lymph nodes. Um, well on its way, acquired CD94, well on its way to becoming an NK cell, uh, but only in tonsil, lymph nodes. And you can see that here. Here we're looking at normal blood. Here we're looking at normal bone marrow, um, normal tonsil. You see it, normal lymph node, you see it, but not in, in blood or bone marrow. So it turns out that there's a disease uh, for which very little, if anything, was known called EBV NKT cell lymphoma. And that's this midline lymphoma, highly fatal malignancy, uh, for which there's no known effective cure. And showing you briefly a picture of this very ugly and disturbing disease. But if you look at four patients with this disease um, in their blood, their bone marrow, or their CSF, look what you see. And so what you see here is 4A cells. And it turns out that um, this, the genesis of this comes from this 4A NK cell, uh, early NK cell. And you can see here, um, can you see my pointer? No? Okay. Well, if you look at normal tonsil and say um, ENKTL4, you see you can compare these two populations. And we've done that, sorted out the normal cells, sorted out the uh, malignant cells. And when we did a comparative analysis, uh, genomic, transcriptional, epigenomic, it turns out that this malignancy uh, up until a year ago is the most hypermethylated malignancy known thus far. And so we took this and put it into an animal model and used 5-ASA, and we could actually show a differentiation of these cells onto NK and a diminution in the, in the uh, virulence of the disease. So we'll be looking to move that towards the clinic. So that was one thing. But um, another thing was this looking uh, at this um, stage three cell that I had someone else look at, and that's right here. And there was a person in the lab, her name is Tiffany Hughes. And I said, Tiffany, we've got to start doing the profiling, you know, phenotypic, transcriptional, epigenetic, and figure out what is it about this stage three cell that's almost an NK cell, but isn't an NK cell. How does it differ? And that'll give us insights into how this process really is going on. And um, 
when she did that, she kept coming to me and saying, you know, there's nothing in there about NK cells. It's like they make IL-22, they have IL-1 receptor, um, they're um, RR, RR gamma T, they don't have uh, TBET, they don't have EOMIs, which are the transcription factors that make an NK cell an NK cell. Um, but you put them in with IL-15 and they'll, they'll go right on to becoming an NK cell. So um, turns out that what she stumbled on was that something two other groups stumbled on in the same in the same year. And that is um, that these cells, stage three, are in fact free NK. They can become NK cells and are driven through a, a transcription factor AHR. And they make IL-22, uh, TH17, remember T helper 17 cells. And that's shown here first in the RNA, and then it's shown in the protein. And you see stage four cells where you're acquiring that CD94 is gone. Uh, no IL-22 at all in the mRNA or in the protein. And, and at the same time, um, you see these two other groups, Hergen Spitz and Marco Colonna, publish the same thing. And you see all of them coming, you know, see human, ours, is, ours paper is stage three immature, NK cells make IL-22. And Hergen did the work in the mouse and said, you know, this NK-like killer cell um, makes uh, IL-17. And Marco Colonna, um, natural killer subset uh, makes IL-22, uh, finding them, you know, in the tonsil and the gut, really the malt tissues. And it turns out IL-22 is very important for intestinal project, uh, protection. It binds to the gut epithelial cells, which then release the antibacterial peptides. Um, but this was the start of what turns out to be, um, you know, the, the breakout on innate lymphoid cells. And people realize, hey, there are these cells they're not NK cells, they're not killers, they don't have the T cell receptor. There's kind of funky parallel to TH1, TH2, TH17, et cetera. Very excited about all of this. We kept working on how does this all work and ourselves and several other groups really worked on identifying the progenitors, the, pre the precursors, as you can see here, and a number of these different um, path intermediates along these various pathways. And these are folks in the lab, all MD, PhD students. And Ronnie, I think, was a new assistant professor at that time working on this uh, and over many years, as, as is the case. So now, fast forward a bit further, that was 2009. And so now when you get out to like 2019, um, there's much more known about these ILCs. And it turns out there's three groups of them, but there are five types. And you can be sure at some point there'll be more, uh, as there was, remember, for those of you old enough, TH1 and TH2 back in the day. Uh, so you see NK cells, you see ILC1s, ILC2s, ILC3s, and lymphoid tissue inducer cells, cells that make the lymphoid tissue. And the first group is NK and ILC1. The second group is just ILC2. And the third group is ILC3s and LTIs. And um, they have distinct um, transcriptional factor, transcriptional profiles, and a distinct spectrum of cytokines that gives them distinct functions. And so here's your transcription factors. You see um, NK cells with TBET and IOMIs, ILC1 with TBET. GATA3 for ILC2, ROR gamma T for ILC3, as well as the LTIs. And then they, they make different proteins. Um, and K have those granzymes, perforin, granzyme B, killer. Um, whereas um, the ILC2s, ILC, ILC1, 2, and 3, um, I think our kids would call them influencers. Um, <laughs> they polarize things, right? Um, the older people might not have understood that, but yes. <laughs> other people did. Um, they influence, right? They polarize. They secrete cytokines that move the immune system one way or the other. And LTIs, as I said, is the cell that's foundational for lymphoid tissue. So, um, and you see here cell cytotoxicity, type 1 immunity, type 2 immunity, type 3 immunity, or TH17, and then lymphoid organogenesis. We're going to talk about ILC1s. Um, there are two in this group of four 
there are two other killer populations in, in there that um, we've found, and I think others have found, um, that really haven't been known. And some of the data is published and some is unpublished. And I'm going to tell you about some really potent killing that these two other subsets do, um, which is kind of surprising because they're influencers. And in one case, uh, the second one, it doesn't occur in the mouse, but it occurs uh, most definitively in humans and uh, I think it has applications. So ILC1s to start, as I said, like a TH1, gamma, TNF, um, defend against all sorts of pathogen invasions. They regulate, regulate the microbiota, um, regulate tissue inflammation, protect against acute tissue damage, polarizing but not cytotoxic, no granules, no, no or pounding molecules. What they do in cancer has really been not well known. And so if you look at, this is a complicated slide, but if you just look at the colored dots on the left, I think you're left, yep. ILC1s are largely found in the liver, a uh, little bit in the circulation, but in the liver, and this is all in mouse now, but I'm gonna show you some unpublished data in humans. And the bottom line is that they don't work well when you have leukemia. Um, you know, they, they, they don't produce, you can see the drastic difference in um, say gamma production, 40, 50% in a wild type or healthy donor. And then it's, you know, 15, 20% um, in somebody with AML. So drastic diminution in their ability to produce gamma, their ability to produce TNF, and it doesn't matter where they are, liver or bone marrow, they don't work well. And, and this led us to the idea that you know, it's the chicken or the egg. Why would AML bother to slap down um, the ILC-1 if it wasn't important? Mother Nature doesn't work that way. It's very efficient in terms of what it does, what it needs to escape the immune system. And so as much as didn't make a lot of sense, we started looking at what could, um, AM, what could ILC-1s be doing in AML. Now to go way back, in time, and I mean way back, this is prehistoric. There are, there are many people here born after 1994, but this is when the whole cancer stem cell business started. And that was done with the laboratory of John Dick at University of Toronto, Sick Children's. And so leukemic stem cells in AML, which is really the first description of those, represents this low frequency, very rare population that possess stem-like properties in that they produce the bulk of leukemia, have self-renewal, and are very, very <laughs> drug resistant. And most people believe at this time that when AML relapses, it's because of following intensive therapy, be it um, immune therapy, traditional chemotherapy, when it does relapse, it's because of these highly resistant leukemia stem cell. It's kind of the, the, the key cell in the genesis and the cure of acute myeloid leukemia. And, and, and to date, there hasn't been a lot of progress in eliminating um, that cell. So I'm gonna talk largely about the mouse and in the end show you some unpublished data in the human, as I mentioned before. So we harvest a lot of leukemia stem cells um, from mice that have leukemia. And the model we use is a model that was created by Nick Zorko, who's an MD, PhD student in the lab, who many of you know and is in this audience today. He's an assistant professor here now. I'm very proud of him. So he created this mouse that has two hits uh, in MLL, partial tandem duplication, and the FLT3 ITD. And when you create combine these uh, defects, this mouse develops um, AML, very much like patients who have similar uh, or identical genetic defects. So Nick, thank you for this. This model's been passed on to tens and tens and tens of labs around, around the world, and certainly the, the stem cells have been given. And so what we did is we took stem cells, leukemic stem cells from this mouse, and then um, ILC1s from healthy mice. And so that's shown here. I'll show you a little human data as well. Get to that a little later, but you see in this diagram, Mice with AML, take leukemic stem cell. Healthy mice, go to the liver, take their ILC1s. Patients with AML, uh, you know, the John Dick original, CD34, 38 negative cell. And then healthy donors, we get them out of blood, which is extremely difficult, but we're able to do that. And then we 
put them together, co-culture them, and really measure cell death, which is really the first experiment we did when we finally showed that it wasn't really working well in the blasts and the leukemic progenitors. And so we went back to the stem cell and measured all of these various uh, parameters for are we in some way killing. Remember, there's no granules or perforin in these cells. So sure enough, picture tells a story, top left, mouse, bottom, human, no ILC1s, that's a, that's, a LS, that's a leukemia stem cell colony. And then you add the ILC1s and you can see a dramatic induction of apoptosis in both the mouse and the human. And I'm just showing you the cell numbers in the mouse and some other data in the mouse, but it's identical in the human. Here we're looking at the induction of apoptosis by flow. That upper right corner, those cells are apoptosed and they're on their way to apoptosing. And then we're looking at uh, caspase, it's induced at the time of uh, apoptosis. And, and then the relative expression of a pro-apoptotic gene back one. And you can see that as the ratio goes from one to two to one to one, um, this goes higher and higher. And in fact, these cells um, are inducing the leukemia stem cell um, in, into uh, apoptosis. And how does it do this without perforin or granzyme B um, or other molecules that puncture holes and, and in, in uh, tumors um, is through gamma interferon. And so you see there's the, the leukemia stem cell on the top left um, without any ILCs, bottom left ILCs, the apoptosis, uh, bottom right anti-TNF alpha in the cocktail, and it doesn't do anything. But top right, you can see that neutralization of gamma leads to uh, reversal uh, largely of, the, of this process. And then likewise, you need cell-cell contact. So this is a transwell experiment where we put the ILCs on one cell side, membrane on the other side. And so even, uh, so even though we know gamma can float through that membrane, there must not be much gamma. Requires cell-cell contact to make that gamma. And so you see uh, the gamma with contact, but none with the transwell. So um, what is it doing in addition to inducing apoptosis the gamma is inhibiting the differentiation of the leukemic stem cells into these leukemia progenitor cells. And that's one step before the AML blast that you see in the periphery of patients and, and these mice. Leukemia progenitor drives to the propagation of AML. And so what you see here, where there's cell-to-cell -cell contact, and in the left, there's no ILCs, and in the right, there's ILCs, um, you see very different, uh, look at the two arrows, the upper left, 2.65, those are the lymphoid, normal lymphoid precursors. And when you put them with the ILC1s, you see those goes from 2% to like 16%. So you're getting differentiation, normal lymphoid cells. And then in the lower right, uh, you see that a drastic diminution in the leukemia progenitor cells. And so when you do that in the transwell plate, and now you look, for example, just the leukemia progenitor cells, you see no difference. So the transmembrane, the lack of cell-to-cell -cell contact prevents um, this from occurring, prevents the normal lymphoid cell development and allows continued uh, leukemia progenitor cell development on the way to the AML blast. And finally, when you look at leukemia stem cells um, only after they've had this exposure to either ILC1s or gamma interferon alone, um, you can see that under the control, the blue is low expression of the lymphoid uh, markers of lymphoid, you know, genetic profile of lymphoid development under control. There's very little. Once you give the gamma or the ILC1, you see high expression of the lymphoid. And the exact opposite, the control, um, you see very high expression of the myeloid. And as you give gammoid and ILC1, you see dissipation of those of the gene expression. And all these experiments that I'm showing you very quickly were um, confirmed using um, neutralization of gamma or using ILC1 knockout cells that have been mice that have been had uh, gamma knocked out. So ILC1 neg, uh, uh, null ILC1s, I'm sorry, gamma interferon null ILC1s. 
I'm just not showing you all that data. So um, here you just see the confirmation with gamma alone, but the opposites were, were done as well. So um, what do ILC1C when they're controlling and killing this leukemia stem cell um, that, by the way, NK cells aren't doing? So I'm not showing you all of that data. Um, and so here you're seeing healthy ILC1s making 12% gamma, and then you see the sick ones, you said, making a lot less, but the NK cells making similar amounts. And so we did a lot of work um, with all sorts of profiling to figure out what is it that ILC1s have that maybe NK cells don't have or have less of that um, is important for cell-to-cell -cell contact that's uh, making this difference. And these cells that are both part of group one ILCs, they both make gamma, they both make TNF. And it turns out that healthy ILC1s, a very high expression of a receptor called DNAM1. NK cells have some, doesn't change whether it's healthy or AML, um, but certainly AML cells, ILC1s from AML patients have very, very low DNAM1. And the ligand for that receptor, so that receptor is on ILC1s, what it sees on AML leukemia stem cells are two different molecules, CD155 and CD112. And here you see them in the orange, both highly expressed on the leukemia stem cell. And um, what you see here is blocking it. So ILC1 alone, very little gamma. Um, ILC1 plus LSC and an irrelevant antibody, you see the gamma. And then when you block DNM1, you see the diminution in the gamma, uh, which is on the x-axis. So what else might they see? Well, it turns out, again, uh, that ILC1s have high expression of the IL-7 receptor, whereas NK cells do not, as you can see here, and LSCs make IL-7. And you can see the transcript here under LSCs. There's no IL-7 from ILC1s from NK cells. And the last line is a water control. And when you look at this ILCs alone, you see there's very little gamma. Um, ILCs plus, I'm sorry, ILC1s uh, alone, no gamma. When you put them with the leukemia stem cell, you see the gamma go up. And when you block IL-7, you see a partial diminution. And of course, if you add blocking DNAM1, you see much more. So these are the two molecules that, at least two, that ILC1s appear to be using, uh, using soluble IL-7, as well as uh, CD155, CD112 on the leukemia stem cell. And further, that when you take ILC1s and you um, expose them to the leukemia stem cells, and you add IL-7, you further bump up the gamma that it produces, showing that this is, this is part of the process. Well, we were able to take this uh, in vivo as well, and these are just experiments to uh, prove a point. This is, a, you see, we're taking a mouse, uh, adding a, a leukemia stem cells, which take, can take a while to turn into leukemia, uh, just giving a single shot of the ILC1s, and, and we give uh, wild-type healthy mouse ILC1s or uh, interferon gamma knockout ILC1s. And what you can see here is that uh, no ILCs, no ILC1s, leukemia stem cells, uh, but there's no, no leukemia stem cells, no ILC1s. Picture the peripheral blood. And then with LSCs, you see no ILC1, lots of blasts in the blood. Um, with wild-type ILC1s, very, very few. And then with the gamma knockout, the reappearance of the, of the myeloid cells. Um, in vivo, you can see the uh, prolongation of survival with the single-shot infusion of the, of the ILC1s that uh, have from normal, normal mice. So, um, you know, it, it appears that these cells have uh, very, very potent activity against leukemia stem cell. So how does the ILC1 secreted gamma interferon do this? What, what is it actually doing? So in that case, we took mice with AML, let's call them Nix mice, and uh, got the leukemia stem cells, healthy uh, sort of from the liver, the ILC1s, co-cultured them together, and then did our RNA-seq analysis uh, with a lot of analysis. This just shows the purification of the cells, the, the post uh, co-culture sorting, 
showing 100% of the LSCs and 100% of the uh, ILC1s. And then taking those LSCs and saying, what happens when this co-culture occurs at a, at a, uh, at a uh, molecular level? And so every picture is telling a story here. You see that when you have co-culture without, with, with ILC1s or just the gamma, um, very high expression of certain genes in the three quarters of the, of the diagram, much higher than the control. And then flip in the upper right, you see a lower expression of a bunch of genes. So it's about 400 genes are going up compared to the control and about 100 genes are going down. So not an easy no-brainer uh, to figure this out. But you know, with the tools available today, a lot can be done. And so I'm just going to summarize what was learned from this. So LSCs co-cultured with the ILC1s or gamma interferon had a large number of upregulated and downregulated genes in common, supporting the fact that ILCs um, are ILC1s are regulating leukemia stem cells through gamma interferon. Second, among the upregulated genes unique to IL-1, just unique just to the co-culture, uh, three of the top 10 were chemokines. And so that told us that this interaction is likely pulling in other cells as well, uh, recruit additional immune cells into the TME to further su suppress the development of AML. And all. I'm not going to show you that. Um, we've, we have shown and published that it, was, it pulls in NK cells. And at that point, NK cells can contribute additional gamma to this process and some cytotoxicity, but not alone. And then LSCs co-cultured with ILC1s or gamma interferon activated apoptotic pathways, which we had shown through the flow diagrams, the proapoptotic uh, back one, um, significantly suppressing E2F targets, uh, G2M checkpoints, MIC targets, mitotic spindle pathways, consistent with our finding that what's happening is an induction of apoptosis. In co-culture with ILC1s or with interferon gamma, um, LSC showed activation of the JAK-STAT and PI3 kinase pathway and a bunch of genes that are all downstream of gamma interferon, strengthening our conclusion that, again, gamma interferon is really responsible for this. And then if you block JAK-STAT or AKT, it significantly increases the ability of the LSCs, um, even in the presence of gamma or the LC1s, to go ahead and differentiate um, into the leukemic progenitor cells and decreases their proliferation into those lymphoid uh, normal cells. So ILC1 derived gamma interferon regulates the differentiation of LSCs through both JAK-STAT and or PI3 kinase AKT signaling. So now just to go to some unpublished work in humans, um, first of all, similar to the mouse, you see uh, very, very low numbers of ILC1s um, in the blood of patients with AML compared to healthy donors. Um, we've done our um, RNA-seq, single-cell RNA-seq on these, and can identify in blood normal uh, ILC1s compared to the ILC2s you see there and ILC3s. Um, and then do the uh, genetic profiling as well and notice a number of genes which fall out uh, in the healthy versus AML ILC1s that uh, show us that functionally these cells are likely very deficient. That's shown on the next slide. Here we're looking at healthy donor ILC1s in the upper left uh, with leukemia stem cells. You see they're making lots of gamma and in the lower left, lots of TNF. And when you go to the right, you see a profound decrease in the amount of gamma they're able to make and the amount of TNF that they're able to make. So these cells, again, um, through mechanisms that aren't exactly clear, um, they're able, AML blasts or AML progenitors or stem cells are able to really uh, put ILC1s into check, uh, allowing tumor escape. Um, taking uh, these cells, which we've now been able to take ILC1s from blood, uh, from humans, expand them about 500-fold to get enough to do some in vivo experiments in various mouse models, and then taking CD34 positive, 38 negative leukemia stem cells, um, we're able to show that there's some anti-leukemia uh, activity uh, with these cells as well. So, um, you know, just adding, and we're giving a little IL-15 as well with these. And obviously some of the mice are getting no ILC1s and others are getting the ILC1. So ILC1s appear to have uh, the anti-leukemia uh, stem cell activity. 
Um, and then we also found that the um, ILC1 seemed to prevent the induction of this macrophage-like cell, um, which you can see visually here, and then in the flow cytometric diagram, there's CD206 positive, CD11B positive, and these cells in a number of publications, we see them in vitro, um, have been shown to have potent leukemia-inducing um, ability. Um, uh, so uh, it was an interesting observation as well. This effect appears to be mediated through TNF because it can be reversed by uh, TNF alpha. Um, as I mentioned, we can produce uh, fair numbers of these cells. This is a process we've developed ex vivo um, to develop, to, to further expand these cells. And we can show, and then we can profile and show that we, in fact, we get all three populations and you can see the, the uh, transcriptional profile of the RNA-seq here. What we do is then take the ILC1, sort them out, further grow them up, and then when we inject these manufactured cells, um, we can show, again, some anti-leukemia activity. So um, again, early phase, um, just starting to bring these cells forward, but importantly, working on leukemia stem cell, not, uh, these are leukemia stem cells which are going into the mice, not not the blast. So we may have found another another cell that that in fact attacks AML besides those that are known, uh, but does so really at the heart of the problem, uh, which is interesting. And we found that if we add a car to this, and these are just some early in vitro experiments, adding the FLT3 car, um, FLT3 being expressed on some leukemia stem cells, we can increase um, both the gamma production in the upper, as you can see, compared to the ILC1s alone, or we can increase, and we can increase the amount of uh, apoptosis. So there's room to move for those interested in the translation of these innate lymphoid cells uh, into the clinic. We're very excited about that. So that's kind of ILC ones. That's one of the two killers that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, and I wanted to talk, as I say, share how we jumped into the uh, into the field of ILCs uh, accidentally by looking for NK cell by classifying NK cell precursors. Um, but there's another killer sleeping amidst these ILCs that, um, that is, a, is an influencer. And um, talk about that again. These are the various transcription factors. These are the various cytokines. These are the various functions. What I really want to talk about is this ILC2. And it turns out that it's a, it's a killer cell as well. Um, even though, as you see, uh, what's known about it to date, uh, both in the mouse and the human, has been a transcription, it's GATA3, uh, makes IL-4, IL-5, IL-9, IL-13, so type two immunity, and um, an influencer. This is what's been known, um, important for helmets, uh, infections, allergens, influenza, um, mouse ILC2s, there's no evidence of cytotoxic function of these cells, and a lot of the work with ILC2s has been done in mouse. Um, and their role in cancer has really been unclear. And so some very recent work of ours, and I got a summary diagram here, and I'm going to run through some things we've learned about um, with this cell. Um, and you can see the various components to this as I run through these. First of all, I just told you it's TH2 properties, but we discovered that the human and not the mouse can express and secrete granzyme B, and largely probably discovered that because not a lot of people working in ILC2s. And generally, we assume if we see it in the mouse, we're going to confirm it in the human. Our lab happens to work in mouse and humans, and we try to confirm what we find in humans and mouse, especially when we need models of genetic disruption. So in this case, looking at ILC2s, as we had looked at ILC1s, showing they had anti-tumor activity, we found that uh, they express and secrete granzyme B, as shown here. And we demonstrated that they can directly lyse both liquid and solid tumors. Um, the lysis occurs both preoptosis as well as apoptosis, both governed by DNAM1, CD155, that I told you about with the ILC1s. Um, and uh, this CD155, 112 is a receptor ligand interaction that induces granzyme B, as shown here through the AKT pathway, but it also, in doing so, um, downregulates the FOXO1 negative regulators. So it further revs this pathway up, both by the induction of granzyme B and then removing uh, the negative regulator, F 
FOX01. But over time, what we found is that the continual stimulation of this DNAM1 interacting with the ligand CD155 and CD112 um, leads to um, a decrease in expression of both DNAM1 itself and uh, the granzymes. And so there's also a mechanism of tumor escape. Um, and we've just shown this in the AML models, not in the solid tumor models. Um, we've done a better job at scaling this cell from blood. First of all, we can start with more ILC2s, human, um, but develop this process where we really can scale them about 2,000 fold and really get a good number of these cells to start doing some more uh, exciting experiments. And the first thing I want to just show you with this is um, the purity of these cells. These are the classic ILC2 markers, and you can see phenotypically uh, what we have here. And then when we look transcriptionally, you know, you can see that they have lots of GATA3, uh, but very little or any EOMIs, which is an NK transcriptional factor, very little, if any, TBET, which is ILC1 and NK, and no ROR gamma T, which is the ILC3s, which we haven't talked about today. And then if you look at a number of these from a number of different donors that we've grown up, uh, you can see that it's really all GATA3 despite, uh, despite repeated the process over and over again. Then if you look at the cytokines they produce, they produce those TH2 cytokines, you know, IL-4, IL-5, IL-9, IL-13. And here we're comparing fresh right out of the blood. And these manufactured cells that take about a month to make, and we freeze them and thaw them. And then when you look at the fold expansion, we've gotten better and better at this. And we're up to now about a 2,000 fold expansion from the number of cells that we use. And of course, the work we're doing is allogeneic. Then we've done some, some single cell uh, RNA-seq on these cells, and they create these profiles that many of you are familiar with. Um, in this case, we're looking at four different cells. We're looking at the expanded ones called ex vivo ILC2s. We're looking at all ILCs in the blood so just taking out the NK cells. So this second one contains ILS, uh, twos and threes, I guess. Um, and then in the third one, we've taken those expanded human, we've put them into a mouse, uh, a skid mouse, and then we've traced them and pulled them out of the bone marrow of the mouse and then profiled them to see, do they hold their profile when they go in vivo? And the last are um, all ILCs in a patient with AML. And so we identified seven distinct subsets, um, five of which are pure ILC2 based on the genes uh, that are expressed. So if you look zero through six, so zero, one, and two are all ILC2. And then if you look three, contains some ILC progenitor cells. There's some, we found some ROR gamma T. Um, and then four is all ILC2. Five is probably just ILC1s, maybe a few contaminated NK cells, and then six is all ILC2s. And if you look at the color of these, um, you see that uh, the, the, um, the uh, expanded ILC2s uh, by this profiling are 97% uh, positive for, for uh, true ILC2 subsets. In other words, they contain very few, if any, ILC group three, or group five uh, by color. And group, as I say, group five, you can see it up there. Um, it's the, the same uh, NK ILC1. You don't see those in expanded cells. So really, really pure. In fact, we found something like one um, ILC1 cell in there amongst like 5,000 cells. So the, the process works. We're able to keep their lineage. Um, we're able to keep their lineage after putting them in vivo. And, uh, and so options for therapy might be, might be available. So importantly, here's, here's some evidence, and we have a lot of it, um, that they do express granzyme B. Uh, these are those pure cells, and this is done both fresh, a uh, little bit of activation, and, uh, and the ones that are expanded, uh, frozen, thawed. And you see the expression of granzyme B. You see the expression of perforin as well. And um, of course, reviewers want proof, big time proof that they kill. And the best way to do this is a single cell. So you take one ILC2 and you take one tumor cell. And so the ILC2 is pink and the, um, the uh, uh, tumor cell is green. Um, I don't know if we can, this, this seems to have been um, moved a bit. I'm not sure. It's, 
yeah, it's not, it's not showing up here. So I'm going to have to go to another, another figure, but I apologize for that. It, it seems to have shifted a little, but anyway, the bottom line is when you have the ILC two in there, um, the green cell becomes blue, which is the death. That's DAPI expression. I think on the next slide I have, um, I can show you, these are three solid tumors. So this is a pancreatic tumor. This is lung cancer, and this is a brain tumor. These are all human, and these are human ILC2s. Um, and so what we're going to see when this starts, I'd encourage you to look either here or here. And early on, you'll see green cells, and then you'll see blebbing, especially down here. And after the blebbing, you'll see they turn, they turn blue. And uh, if I can get it to work. There you go. So take a look. There's, there they are. See the blebbing there? I uh, see the blue cells starting to come in uh, as well, as well as up here. So the pink cells are the ILC2s. So, um, yeah, they kill, um, which is really cool and uh, very excited about it. And then just these, again, are not meant to be definitive. These are single shot human ILC2s. And the, on the left, um, you see uh, an AML model in the middle, a pancreatic model, and on the right, a brain tumor model. The brain tumor model is a direct intratumoral injection into the brain. And in all instances, you see some significant prolongation, but this is this is early on experiments that I'm really uh, sharing with you. So um, I wanted to talk today, uh, not about NK cells, because Jeff's in the audience. I'm sure he still didn't learn anything, but he knows all of this and uh, Bruce and others. Um, but really, uh, give a little broader uh, educational session to those that might not study what we study. Um, talk a little bit about human NK cell development, not to talk so much about the development, but to tell a story about how pursuing your passion, going deep and not necessarily wide, sometimes you stumble upon things that open up other areas of research, which, which you all know. And I wanted to tell you the story about how that happened for us. Um, talk to you, like, why study NK development? Well, same with B cells and T cells and myeloid cells. That's where uh, the gold is in terms of understanding malignant transformation. There just haven't been many examples of it in NK cell, but as I showed you, the NKT, EBV uh, lymphoma, we're starting to get an edge on that pathogenesis because there's a precursor that has malignantly transformed. And then how studying the uh, the the uh, the one NK precursor led us to find these IL-22 secreting cells that two other groups found as well, ultimately called ILC3s, and then ILC2s and ILC1s and uh, lymphoid tissue inducer cells, um, all coming from the studies, all three groups coming from the studies of NK cells in the gut or the tonsil. And then finally, um, a real sleeper that... Uh, they're not only influencers, but at least two of them, and I'll bet somebody finds ILC3s, uh, they're killers. Uh, they just don't kill uh, in a way that was so obvious. In the case of ILC1s, gamma interferon. Turns out, who would have thunk it? Can apoptose um, leukemia stem cell, and in both mouse and in human, and then uh, ILC2s, turns out, if you're looking in the mouse, you're not going to find perforin, uh, you're not going to find granzyme B, but if you look in humans, you do. And uh, we were able to find that, um, actually discover the mechanism by which they're seeing uh, the, the cells through the DNAM1 receptor and, uh, and then able to expand them pretty significantly ex vivo and start uh, some work towards, uh, towards an IND. So the picture I showed you in the beginning was NK, NK, and T. As you can see, um, that may not be so definitive. And I think most importantly, you should understand we're at the beginning of this story. There'll be a lot more over the years. Um, I've talked about really 30 years of work from my lab and the lab of uh, my colleagues at NYU. So I wanted to show you just a couple of pictures of people back in the day. This is when we had moved to Ohio State University. Look at that young Caligiuri on the right. Man, looking good. And uh, this is uh, 15 years later. Uh, good group, and uh, again at Ohio State. This is uh, right before leaving Ohio State. That is our Donna Bucci in the front. She is our lab supervisor for all the years we were there. Uh, super helpful. And this is our group uh, actually last year um, at City of Hope. And I want to especially acknowledge Xinhua Yu, who, uh, who's really responsible for the day-to-day -day work in the lab and a, 
a, a co-colleague of mine, equally, if not greater, responsible for the work I'm sharing with you today. And then lastly, I wanted to talk to you uh, for a moment, you know, having the, the honor to give this lecture for Dr. Kersey and having been to the University of Minnesota now three times to the Cancer Center. Doug, thank you for the invitation. Um, I wanted to just mention a very good friend of Dr. Kersey's, uh, uh, Clara Bloomfield, who was at the University of Minnesota uh, for many years. She trained in hematology and oncology here, first woman to become full professor at the University of Minnesota in medicine, and then left after, I think, like 30 years here and went maybe maybe not quite 30, maybe like 20, 20 something years and came to Roswell Park Cancer Institute where she was head of medicine and then went to Ohio State uh, to become the head of the cancer center. And Clara is my lifelong mentor. And uh, I just thought it was very important to mention this. She dedicated her career to understanding how chromosomes at first with Janet Rowley and then on her own and then molecular defects uh, probably the world's authority in this area of how it predicts prognosis and, of course, identified targets for all of us to look for and to treat. Uh, just a real trailblazer. She passed away about two years ago, a good friend of John's, and I'm especially grateful for the foundational work she did here with all of you at the University of Minnesota. It certainly served me well, as it turns out. So thank you very much for your time. Happy to stick around. Nice of you to stick around. Went a little over the hour. Very nice of you. I know they said we could stay for a half hour, but I'm sure you don't know the answers. So if you have to leave, please leave. Okay. Thanks much. Can I start off with a couple questions? As long as we're not about NK cells. It's a, it, well, it's, um, it's more about, so what do we know about NK cells versus IOC one and two? Really, in two scenarios that I think are dominating our higher resolution thinking, you know, one is the resistance to exhaustion and the other is resistance to a toxic microenvironment. Do we know anything differentially about these subsets? Yeah, it's a great and, question. And how they interact with each other, Yeah, to throw another coin in there. Yeah, um, that's a short answer. <laughs> My father used to say to me, what does it mean when I don't answer? Not, no. Um, you know, this is the ILC2 work, first of all, is like fresh off the boat. Yeah. It's, 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 it's in its infancy. And we're, we're now, the, because the ILC1 cells are so difficult to get out of the blood, largely in the liver, and to expand, we've not had the success we've had ILC2s, uh, very little. But undoubtedly, like, Unfortunately, I don't know why that single cell assay, but what that allows you to do is to really look at serial killing and to see, compare it. It's a, it's a beautiful assay and we've done a lot of it, but now what I have them doing in the lab is, okay, add another tumor cell, add another tumor cell, add another tumor cell, and do side by side with NK cell. And so do we see NK killing? Do we see ILC1 killing, ILC2 killing? And when do we see exhaustion? When does it stop? To start to look the, macroscopically at that and then biologically. Tucker, yes. So Clara was here. The question I'm going to ask you, she would take me out behind the woodshed. Uh -huh. uh, in the case of human in the case of human AML uh, leukemic stem cells. Mm -hmm. I think I recall that in those cells the cytogenetic abnormality is already fixed. Mm -hmm. It's already there. Mm -hmm. So do you know whether AML stem cells with different cytogenetic abnormalities show differences in sensitivity to ILC1? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't. Um, we've got, uh, so when I was at Roswell Park uh, with Clara, so Clara recruited me right out of my fellowship at the Farber to Roswell Park. I was her first recruit. She brought Ellis Levine with her, and I was her first. I was her first, who was here, and I was her first recruit outside. And, um, you know, she got me interested in AML. I was interested in NK cells. She got me interested in AML. We started Leukemia Tissue Bank. I think one of the first, and it grew and grew. We got CLGB funding for it and uh, mm -hmm. took it to Ohio State and uh, have lots of leukemias to, to, to answer that question. They're all classified by Clara, but I don't have the answer. And I had to see whether, you know, we use many different, 
miles from many different patients. But they tend to be the patients who are freest, right? Because you got the most cells, you can do the most sorting, get the most stem cells. So I'm sure there will be biologic differences because <clears throat> while they're all AML, the molecular defects that want the somatic defects that they acquire largely, I would guess, I'm just guessing, but I largely uh, result in alternate means of tumor escape, uh, be it resistance to ILC1, be it the, what I was showing, what I think might, to Jeff's point, might be exhaustion of the DNAM1. Uh, remember I was saying that with the DNAM1 engagement, uh, what eventually happens is that the DNAM1 stops recirculating on the surface of the ILC and the granules go away. This is the ILC2 and AML. It's clearly, it's the AML is just beating it at its game. It's just, you know, it's able to kill some, but it exhausts the pathway. So um, whether that'll happen in the 30 or so different types of genetic or normal cytogenetic, but molecular defect AML, great question. She, she would like that question. Yes. So thanks for uh, such an informative and interesting and talk. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm curious, do you think uh, ILC ones or twos could be leveraged for cancer therapy using an engager type molecule analogous to a bite? And what do you know about trafficking uh, to tumor of ILC one or two? Great question. So first one, yes, absolutely. This is, this is really in its infancy. You know, we don't even really fully, I think, know um, differences between NK and, and ILC1s in terms of receptor expression. I would argue that any NK cell engager you're using is likely pulling along. You got a DNAM1 engager. Um, I don't know about NKG2D, but DNAM1 engager would definitely pull along even better um, ILC1s. So absolutely. Second part of your question was trafficking. Yeah. Now, don't know anything about trafficking, but um, we have some work going on right now looking at uh, various transcriptional readers. And we found that when we decrease one of the readers, um, knock it down, we get amazing increase in trafficking into solid tumors. <laughs> so I think our lab can't be the only one in the world working on this. Um, I think a number of people uh, are going to find that alter you know and 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 it's and it's it's not in the it's it's in the tumor uh tumor intrinsic um so to tucker's point you know it's probably one of the mechanisms that solid tumors use to keep such cells lymphoid cells i don't know nk versus t versus ilc ones uh out of their space is this uh these uh transcriptional readers so there's going to be a lot of progress there's jeff knows there's so many people working on trafficking improving um, you know, the uh, pluripotent, the, the stem cells, the uh, iPSCs, by all adding molecules to them. Um, we're, we're no question we're going to be able to make ILC2s, ILC1s out of pluripotent stem cells. It's just a matter of time. We can make them out of CD34 cells. So it's just, it's going to happen. And then adding your, you know, so it'll, it'll happen. And uh, but I think getting to your first part, you know, the, the ILC1s, they, they kill the leukemia stem cell. So, you know, you could think of a post remission, a post induction ILC1 therapy where you're just really what's left, what's important are the stem cells. They're the only, and, and you've got less, you know, um, confusion for the lymphoid system in, in getting there without trillions of blasts. So you could think of a, of a, um, a post, post induction ILC1 therapy, but the challenge right now is expanding them. I, I showed it's nothing like the ILC twos, so we got to we got to work on that, or better understanding how to modify our NK cells to make them ILC one like, you know. Um, so yes, yes. Oh yeah, kind of kind of related to that. Then, uh, so your expansion of the ILC twos, uh, the stability of those, um, it looked like. They're pretty stable. You get them going yeah. with with IL two, IL seven, IL fifteen. Yeah, and then you know they sort of slowly expand. It, if you hit them with something you know else like a mitogen or something, you can proliferate more. Do they sort of fall off the wagon? And and more importantly, in vivo, sort of ontologically, how are they a stable 
population of cells or do they just sort of disappear? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the first part of the question is yes. Uh, if you activate them using the extreme or less extreme, they get activated like IL-23, you know, they're, they're, they're TH, you know, um, um, TH2 type cell. Mm -hmm. Yes, they activate them, but you can like, if you use PMA, anamycin, the granzyme goes really, really high. And, uh, but you can activate them with other cytokines. In vivo, we know less. You saw the tracer experiment. Um, that was done a week later without cytokine uh, support. And <clears throat> it, they're, they're wonderfully stable. But, you know, I, I suspect they will be, they probably will not have memory um, in the traditional sense. And they will probably not, you know, uh, end up being sustainable without some sort of support, like some of what Jeff's done with uh, artificial IL-15 molecules and that. Um, so you could either do that or multiple doses, which is what we're doing in some of our some of our trials. So, uh, but yeah, they're not T cells, uh, and that's important to recognize. I always say. You know, Mother Nature didn't put NK cells, keep them around because they're they're like T cells. Doesn't work that way. They have been gone long ago. So have to treat them differently. And we're just trying to understand now, how do we treat these ILC2s? ILC1s will stay alive with IL-15 uh, in vivo. But yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, um, fantastic talk. I was, um, I really loved your influence analogy, and I think I might steal that if you don't mind. Which um, analogy? The influencer analogy. Oh yeah. Um, it was I probably fantastic. got it from my kids. You know. <laughs> um, my question is, I think TGF beta has become quite a prominent cytokine recently in the yeah. field. Um, I'm curious about do these ILCs produce TGF beta? How are they influenced by TGF beta? Do you know it all? Yeah, boy, I I do know it because I read it recently. In one of our papers, <laughs> and I forgot it. I think it's ILC twos. Damn things are so confusing, you know. I think it's that ILC two secretes some TGF beta. Yeah, but that paper is going to come out in in uh, two like two weeks. So uh, it's there. There, I, literally, I'm not exaggerating. It's like 120 figures in it, or tables, and you know. Supplemental, it's like crazy these days. It's like, I'm not, so I can't, you know, the brain is, you know, so I'm no influencer. It's been a while. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to put my veterinarian hat on. Okay. So um, when you look at the uh, evolution of the immune system, there's, there's some very apparent differences between the selection that uh, adaptive and innate cells um, have as species develop. And it looks like um, what, the little we know about innate cells in other species, they seem to be much more plastic or adaptable to different evolutionary paths. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know about ILCs in, uh, you know, going back from humans and mice? Have they been found in invertebrates or other animals? And do they retain similar functions? Yeah, so I've pretty much exhausted my knowledge right in front of this place about ILCs. <laughs> um, so, and I apologize for that. Um, I've not looked at that. Uh, it's interesting that from an evolutionary standpoint, it's, it appears, and our reviewers agreed, that ILC2s seem to have broken off with their cytolytic abilities uh, from mice. That's just not a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I would be shocked because it is, and K-cells are known in you know, in the earliest fish, uh, vertebrate and invertebrate. So I'd be shocked if they don't have it because at least the ILC3s are a definite precursor of NK cells. In fact, this AHR drives ILC3s to NK. And we had a paper a while ago that shows that AML secretes AHR ligands um, that block that, 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 that block um, the, the uh, progression of ILC3s to NK. Um, so, you know, not only are these cells related, but tumors have figured out how they're related and how to block transcriptional progression. 
Um, I think put, obviously had blood a few years ago. Bethany Mundy from her lab. Nick might have been on that paper as well, where they you know they secrete these ligands and they keep them at stage three. Can't become a potent, more potent gamma producing or killer cell. But I don't. I, I'm just. I'm guessing from NK work. These are only ten years old, so a lot of fun for people that are going to go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, did, you had a question as well, and I. Uh, so I have a question about uh, over here. Yeah. Oh, hi. So, uh, have you been able to study interaction of ILC ones with normal hematopoietic precursors? Would they have uh, any role in uh, states such as aplastic anemia? What we've studied are, and I, I have the data. I just didn't show it because just time uh, that neither ILC ones nor ILC twos. So, ILC ones do not kill normal hematopoietic stem cells. That's what we've we've shown. Uh, they, and I was wondering, what is the ligand for DNAM on? Uh, uh, it's the CD155 uh, and CD, which is, I think, Jeff, isn't that like the vaccinia receptor or something? It's it's a viral receptor. Uh, it's CD155 and CD112. Yeah, uh, because there was a paper in the 90s from Ir Weissman saying that CD96, which is a close cousin of DNAM, hmm. Which is a leukemia stem cell marker. I was wondering if this has oh. any yeah. implication. It could be with ligand the might be on the ILC one. I I don't know. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Yes. So first of all, you know, on behalf of people who are influenced by influencers, thank you uh, for this master class. You know, my question is: any insight into why in patients with AML ILC one don't work as well? You know, you kind of mentioned DNM one exhaustion, but. Does yeah. the receptor fall off? Is it clipped? Is there some? No, we're 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 on that, you know, because you learn so much about what's important by just saying what does the tumor do to the cell, and so um, clearly the you know NF kappa B. I didn't show the data, but we did lots of profiling, and NF kappa B and its pathways is drastically reduced in the ILC ones of um, of. Um, AML patients compared to healthy ILC ones. You know, we did those plots, and you know, it's, it's just that it's profoundly different. so. NF kappa B must be a target of NF of AML cells. How they do that, though, I don't know. That was a great question. Yes. Thank you for a really beautiful talk. Um, I'm not an immunologist, but so this could be really naive. Looking at your cells with GATA three and wanting to expand those, I mean, that transcription factor is regulated by steroid hormones. Do you, do you guys put a drop of estrogen or anything in there? Do you have sexual dimorphism for oh, these? Um, question. They might expand better. Um, hormones are, yeah, they're almost everything works better with hormones. Yeah, so. I certainly do. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't, but thank you for that thought. That's what I was hoping. You know, you learn the most from people that don't do what you do, but can understand what you're talking about and they think differently. And then they come up with these amazing, like, who would have thunk it ideas, you know? But I will do that. And that might help the expansion of the of the ILC twos. Yeah. I'll need your name for the patent. I'll introduce you. Start with cortisol and get a protesterone and estrogen. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. And my question is, I'm a solid tumor person. And then uh, there, there, I wonder if you amplify ILC2 and inject, how those cells will be, will maintain the character and the function in the <clears throat> soy tumor microenvironment where a lot of cytokines are different from a peripheral blood yeah. division? Yeah, it's a great question. And the answer right now is I don't know, but I was saying earlier that we're looking at um, transcriptional readers in tumors. And we've shown that when you downregulate some of those readers, um, that um, you can vastly improve the trafficking of lymphoid cells into solid tumors. Uh, having said that, uh, and we published a few papers on, on these readers, um, I can't go beyond that, like how it does that you know, because there's extracellular matrix, which is huge. 
Um, there's secretion of all sorts of TGF beta like cytokines that suppress. I'm sure it's related to those things. Um, but that, that's, that's in solid tumor, um, you know, um, cell, cellular therapy. That's, of course, the holy grail is, you know, and, and the liquid tumors, you don't have those. And guess what? They work uh, for lymphoid tumors. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, these are simple models that we've just done a single shot. One thing I can tell you, and we've published this for pancreatic cancer, is that can we use CAR NK for pancreatic, and it, we can cure the disease. Um, intraperitoneal administration, because you can do the trafficking studies, brings the cells to the pancreas, whereas intravenous brings it to lung and liver. So nobody does. Very few people do intraperitoneal, uh, and so route of delivery for pancreatic cancer really helps trafficking. Uh, but but there's got to be a lot more to it that a solid tumor does to keep keep growing. So thank you.